FOMO. Hey there, FOMO sapiens. For today's episode, I dug into the vault. This episode is one of my favorites, and I've gotten a lot of feedback on this one. People just really like it because it's positive, and my guest is so knowledgeable about the fantastically wonderful and weird world of watches. Wow, alliteration. That's pretty impressive for uh, for a December read. Eric Wynn, who's my guest, is an expert on watches. The guy knows, I mean, it's he has this knowledge of watches that's incredible. In fact, I once saw him speak in New York City at this watch event, and he is a rock star in the watch world. And when he came on FOMO Sapiens, he told some amazing stories. He talked about watches. And given the fact that we are on Christmas Eve putting the show out, I thought, in case you haven't made that last minute purchase yet, and you have a lot of money rolling around in your bank account, maybe you have some Bitcoin to sell, you can listen to what Eric says and go out and find a watch for yourself or somebody that you love. So I love this episode, and I just wanted to pull it out of the vault and give you this as a little present for Christmas Eve. So enjoy the episode, and uh, have a great holiday. FOMO. Get an email from Kevin Kwan, who's a friend, who's the author of Crazy Rich Asians. Who follows you on Instagram, as, yeah. one, as one does. and he's a watch collector, um, and he sent me an email and said... We're filming Crazy Rich Asians in Malaysia right now. We're filming a watch scene on Wednesday. Um, the director, John M. Chu, would like to have a serious watch. There was a watch that had been loaned to the production from Ublo, but he didn't think that would impress watch collectors. Sorry, Ublo. Sorry, <laughs> Ublo. And is there any way you can help us find a watch? That's Eric Wind. He's one of the world's leading experts when it comes to vintage watches. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. When the world's spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term, and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO Sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. The world of collecting is one in which FOMO can drive aficionados to drop hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars on that one special item that will fill out their collection and give everyone else FOMO. From art to cars to watches, collectors operate within a market where emotion can easily trump logic. Even though it's often thought of as the realm of hobbyists, collecting is a big business and you can learn strategies and secrets to make the most of your time and money. My guest today is going to pull back the curtain on this hidden world for us. Eric Wind owns Wind Vintage, a company dedicated to offering exceptional watches for sale at all price points and providing advisory services to top vintage watch collectors worldwide. Eric previously served as Vice President Senior Specialist for Christie's, where he helped lead the sale of a number of important watches at auction. He has been featured and quoted in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Wall Street Journal, and the Financial Times, and he has written for Hodinkee. He is a graduate of my alma mater, Georgetown University, and Oxford University. Eric Wind, welcome to FOMO Sapiens. Thanks, Patrick, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, so I like to start my show by asking everybody the same question. And the question is, uh, we all get a little FOMO sometimes. So what turns you into a FOMO Sapiens? The biggest thing is just email, I would say. People cold emailing trying to respond in a timely manner. They're looking for a watch, They're looking at a watch on my website collaboration opportunity, et cetera. So those are uh, definitely get me concerned about are, responding. Are you one of these people who, who responds to emails right away, like the zero inbox? Because I'm zero inbox. I try, but it's very difficult. It's a tyranny. It's yeah. the tyranny of email. <laughs> it is. I hate email. <laughs> so Eric, the reason why, I mean, I get why you need to respond to email quickly because you are, um, you're, a, you're a global man of intrigue and, you know, to show, I guess the, the listeners kind of what you do, I want you to tell the story about crazy rich Asians because this story, I remember hearing this from, we, we, we went to the same university. We have lots of friends in common. And when I heard the story, it gave me FOMO. Um, because I just thought it was so cool that I wish it was me that this happened to. So tell me the story. So it's Monday morning. Um, my family and I are uh, on a brief little vacation. I open my email, get an email from Kevin Kwan, who's a friend, who's the author of Crazy Rich Asians. Who follows you on Instagram, as, yeah. one, as one does. and he's a watch collector. Um, and he sent me an email and said, 
We're filming Crazy Rich Asians in Malaysia right now. We're filming a watch scene on Wednesday. Um, the director, John M. Chu, would like to have a serious watch. There was a watch that had been loaned to the production from Hublot, but he didn't think that would impress watch collectors. Sorry, Hublot. Sorry, <laughs> Hublot. And is there any way you can help us find a watch? Um, so my mind begins thinking about if I run to New York, I was in Florida at the time, get a watch, fly there, that's probably 24 hours to get there via... Um, you know, ha would have to fly through an intermediate place like Dubai or something. I had been to Indonesia recently uh, through Dubai, and I that was a FOMO moment. I'm like, how am I going <laughs> to get a watch there? There's not enough time to get it there for filming on Wednesday, <laughs> and it just it was like hours away. So I began calling uh, collector clients in Asia, Hong Kong, um, Indonesia, etc. No one really knew what Crazy Rich Asians was. The The book is more popular in the West um, at that time than in Asia, funnily enough. So, um, and also these are, you know, six-figure watches. They're fragile. Everyone worries about a non-expert holding the watch. If you dropped it, you could lose hundreds of thousands in value with wow. loom falling off or dials cracking, et cetera. So no one was really eager to loan a watch. Um, finally, I called another dealer in uh, California, Eric Kuz, a friend of mine, and said, do you have any ideas? Um, he had a client in Singapore who had a few watches, and he actually had talked with the client and knew the client's wife was a fan of Crazy Rich Asians, which was just unusual because that was before the global phenomenon of the movie. So, um, And during that time, I also reached out to a few brands, uh, Long uh, uh, Jager Le Coultre, or Jaeger Le Coultre, as we say in the U.S. and others. Well, um, I didn't know that's how you pronounce it. That's yeah, awesome. that's how they, yeah. <laughs> so they they were like, uh, they don't really understand it either. And to turn around something within a day is very difficult, obviously, with insurance and all these other things. So um, ended up connecting with a collector by the afternoon in Singapore who said he would loan his watch. Logistics were confirmed. They sent a security guard to Singapore from Malaysia. Uh, he flew over, flew it back, and then they filmed the scene. And uh, the director wasn't even aware of all the logistics. We were in touch with like maybe eight different prop people, et cetera, during this time. There was insurance forms filled out, all these things. And by the uh, by the end of the day, we heard that they filmed the scene and it went really well and they could return the watch the next day. So and how long is the scene, by the way, just for those of us who maybe watch it's the about film? It's about 10 seconds uh, when um, Astrid's character gives uh, the watch to her husband. Oh, and he doesn't like the watch out. because well, he doesn't yeah. want to be a you know. Owner. Yeah, yeah, and he's shirtless in bed and then she hands him a $600,000 yeah. watch and says it's a you're a ceo you can dress like it now yes so. well astrid if you need to give the watch to somebody else eric and i are here yes definitely um that's an, an amazing story and it shows you oh, it's, i think it's quite impressive that they went through all this it also shows you the kind of network that you've built in the watch world that you were able to basically talk to everybody who's everybody and then pull something together it was on yeah, the it was fly. crazy yeah and it was uh it was really interesting <laughs> wow so so you're in this watch world, and, and the other night you spoke at the Horological Society of New York, and I dropped in where I saw all the horologs. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hor horologists, at right. least. <laughs> but, yeah. the, fans of, the fans of horology yes, yeah. were all, files, I guess. all in attendance, and it was amazing because what the word that I heard over and over again that night, besides things like um, crystal and um, strap, was Instagram. And in fact, the, the way that the, the event was described in the email, it said, and this is in quotes, the field of vintage watches is an interesting place with more minefields than ever in the realm of collecting, a staggering amount of animosity on social media and watch for yeah. So I didn't realize that this is like, this is worse <laughs> than sort of political discussions on Facebook. It it is getting Trumpified, the, the, uh, the world of watch collecting. So talk about that. What is going, What? Wh why does Instagram matter in the world of watches? What is happening and how does this play out in the collection space? Um, Instagram has done a few things. One, it's 
been a place for collectors to show off their watch collections. It's not uncommon for dealers I speak with to spend two to three hours per day on Instagram. Wow. Uh, writing people, posting stuff for sale, um, trying to buy watches that people show, um, doing hashtag searches for different models, which I do sometimes if I'm looking for something. Um, it's, uh, it is become a really big part of the community, which it wasn't eight years ago um, or six years ago. So um, as a, there's been a rise in values, all these different personalities, there are a bunch of spoof accounts now that make fun of people, make fun of dealers, make fun of auction houses. Um, it's, uh, there's been, there's some good humor for sure, which you get to laugh at, and there's some really nasty things being written. Um, and the watch uh, fora, which have traditionally been a place for scholarship and research and kind of watch nerds, as we call them, to support each other and say, hey, look at this cool thing. I think as values have also risen a lot, have become places where there's a lot of backbiting and jealousy and animosity. Um, there's still definitely a large group of people that are very nice, but it's tainted by the maybe 5% of people that are uh, really bad apples. And are these people who are trolling, do they even have nice watches or well, are they kind of the bystanders? A lot of times they don't and they're <laughs> mad that the market has passed by them or that they bought the things that haven't gone up in value, things like that. Um, so yeah, generally these people aren't the most successful. Otherwise they wouldn't be spending their time sort of ripping other people. <laughs> Fair point. It's funny because I actually have followed a couple of the Instagram accounts for a period of time, but I always unfollow because I, there's a lot of hairy wrists in it. In it. It's, it's just true, right? The and only thing worse than a hairy wrist, though, are some people that shave their wrists and oh. you see the little stubble. It's hilarious. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so I would watch them and I, I find it really interesting. And, and I've seen, you know, you, you um, display, for example, in New York City, there's a store called Rolling Blazers, which is owned by um, a former guest on the show, Jack Carlson. And you have a bunch of your watches on display and they're, they're in a case and they're beautiful. And so I, I enjoy watching them. But sans hairy wrist, the, the yes. hairy wrist is, yeah. brings a, a whole other element to it. <laughs> Definitely. So, so you got into this. I you got into this world. Um, I, I don't know how one gets into the world of watches, but but this is something that you 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 went to Georgetown. You you then worked in, P, in in sort of PR in DC. Then you went and got an MBA at Oxford, and then you went and started working in a startup in Florida. But all the time, you on your on the side as a ten percent entrepreneur, yes. as we call it, which yep. is if 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 you haven't um, heard about ten percent entrepreneurs, it's a book I wrote a couple of years ago about how to be an entrepreneur without quitting your day job. Eric was doing this, and then you eventually transitioned. You made like one of the most inspiring leaps I've ever seen from yeah. this startup, kind of doing this on the side, to actually being at Christie's, you know, which is one of the, I guess, the place where all the action is. How yes. did this all happen? How did you get into this world? And how did you how did you go after your dream? Because I think that's pretty audacious. It was. It was never something planned. Um, I was passionate about watches, got interested toward the end of college. It started with my grandfather's watch, which my mother gave to me. Um, it was a simple Hamilton that my grandmother gave to him for their wedding in 1947. Nice. It was my first mechanical watch, and I was just amazed by this world of, you know, 200 parts keeping time accurately uh, without, and, and that was, you know, 70 years old almost, uh, I guess at that time over 60 years old. Um, so that was the start. And then you begin reading blogs, the watch for a, um, talking with collectors, buying things on eBay, kind of bidding on things, losing a lot, but occasionally winning. Um, you know, just starting with three, four hundred dollar Seikos, then moving up to some Hoyers in the one to two thousand dollar range, and then going up from there. Uh, and then you can make a little money, maybe flipping something you don't like exactly because you bought it well. And then it just becomes like a fun hobby. So around that time, Hodinkee started, which uh, was how I really got into it. I was very interested. It was primarily vintage watches at that time. And I got to know the founder, Ben Clymer. He was about to start journalism school at Columbia and asked if I wanted to start writing back in 2010. And I said, sure, that'd be amazing. So then I started writing. That really forces you to learn a lot more because you're 
you're writing for an audience and you can't have inaccurate the statements. The trolls will come after yeah, you. Yeah, so if you write something wrong, people will have uh, pitchforks out. So I did that for five years, including while I was at Oxford a little bit doing an MBA. Uh, and then I sort of ramped it up more after when I got a job with a biofuel venture. Then during that time, I got to know the key actors in the auction world because I was writing about auctions and no one else really was. Um, so I got to know John Reardon over the course of four years. He's became the head of Christie's and there was a big shakeup where a lot of personnel had left Christie's to go to Phillips. They were in need of some more people. He approached me a couple times. I said, you know, I really, they said, if you want to stay in Florida, you could be a consultant. Otherwise you can move to New York and be full time, but the pay isn't amazing to have a family in New York city. So I said, well, I'd really want to stay in Florida. Um, and, uh, obviously I need benefits like health insurance and all those things. So he worked it out eventually where I think I became the first, uh, specialist at Christie's. I had become a senior specialist with, uh, full benefits working from home basically, uh, and 200 plus years of history. But, um, <laughs> making history yeah, yeah. one watch at a time yeah so then that then it was a really busy experience a lot of travel I was probably on the road 50 to 60 percent of the time which is a lot uh, with a young family but you're traveling overseas to all the auctions traveling across the U.S. to get watches to meet with collectors uh, and then after about two and a half years I decided I could, was in a position where I knew a lot of people had a very positive reputation in the community and could start my own company. So that was also a leap of faith to do that. That's amazing. And what I love about the story is I've, I saw, I watched this as a friend. I remember Eric took this job in Florida at this startup and I thought like, you know, that sounds interesting, but this guy should be working in watches and you know, this is, he's, he's, this is what he loves. He's passionate, yeah. but you know, you, you hadn't quite found your entry yet. And then, um, you know, I thought you should be the 10% watch entrepreneur. Maybe. <laughs> yes. That's, yeah, definitely. It's a terrible joke. It was a dad joke right there. <laughs> yeah. But I remember the day that you announced you were going to Christie's and you already had a big following in the watch world because of Hodinkee. And, you know, I, if you don't know Hodinkee, Hodinkee is the place to go check it out um, for watches. It's really, it's a really smart, well-written site. And they also like John Mayer, the, the singer writes for Hodinkee. It's a really cool kind of, you know, part of the internet. And, um, he Eric posted on Instagram, good old Instagram, that he was going to do this job, and I never saw as many likes. It was like watching somebody self actualize in one post. <laughs> it, so nice. it really was. I mean yeah. that. And and you know, to see somebody go after what they wanted and to then succeed at it. And as I said the other night at the Horological Society, it was like you know, it was almost as if you know the. Yes. Well, I guess you are a celebrity in the watch room. Was in the room. Everybody was taking pictures of you. It was very cool. So you know that's what happens when you when you bloom where you're planted and you pick the right garden. Um, so when you, it's just interesting. Like you, so you went to Christie's and what what is that like? Who are you dealing with? Because the the one thing about Eric you should know is that. Eric's from Wisconsin. It's not like Eric grew up on Fifth Avenue in New York City and had 57 Rolexes as a kid. He's, he's you know, flesh and blood from, you know, I don't know, how big is your hometown? 34,000. Okay, that's big compared to my hometown, man. <laughs> but, you know, this is, you know, you're, you're, you're somebody who worked for everything you got. And then you're dropped into this world of, you know, crazy rich Asians, crazy rich Americans, crazy rich Brits, all these other people. So what is that like? How do you deal with those types of people? How do you manage that? And, you know, what, what's, what's it like in that world? It's, it's very interesting because people have such broad array of personalities. So one thing you're dealing with may be the gentleman who bought this watch back in 1970 and just learned that it's 200 some thousand dollars. That might be the regular, <laughs> the regular guy who, uh, you know, was a businessman. I met, you know, people that were definitely not wealthy, but they had bought this watch because they wanted a Rolex back then. Relatively, it was a lot less expensive, I feel like, than today. Um, and they learned it's worth a lot, so I could connect with them. But then you're dealing with, you know, titans of industry and uh, sort of masters of the universe as well on the buying side. So you need to learn how to deal with those people as well. They, they're going to want it quick, snappy, and they're going to want to like you as well. So it's it's really an array of people you have to work with in that world. 
So Eric, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about collecting because you um, you work with collectors. You are a collector. Uh, what I've learned about the watch world and listening to some of the stuff you talk about is that there's been a huge appreciation in assets. So shocking, and maybe you'll give us some examples about how watches have appreciated in value. And there also there's a whole fashion element, there's a trend element. Some things get hot, then they're not anymore. It's like a couple of years ago, everybody wanted X, Y, Z. Now you can't sell those. Now everybody wants like a stainless steel cases and you know yep. all this stuff that that is quite interesting as an outsider to watch how f- how how volatile it is so yep. if 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 i you know, let's let's imagine that you're talking to the eric wind from 10 years ago and you're buying your first couple watches for a couple hundred bucks on ebay what are the keys to being a collector and to building you know some value and also a collection that you love um I think the first thing is really understanding what you're buying so looking to make sure it's all correct these are tools so it's very common for most of these to be to have replacement parts from service incorrect parts you know bringing it to the watchmaker down the street who's jerry rigging these things or parts have fallen off etc and replacing them with incorrect parts um heavily polished cases because they want it to look shiny but then it kind of looks like an amorphous blob of metal (laughs) um so um that's the first thing trying to understand what the condition is um and then uh really the cardinal rule is buy what you like don't just follow trends um and then the other rule for someone getting in is to buy the seller so really to buy uh from a reputable source the ebay is the wild west as i call it because you see all kinds of fakes um it's really not a good entry point for someone without a lot of expertise or who's willing to spend a lot of time learning um, about it. I would say in general, watch collecting is interesting for people because it's a whole world of detail and nuance. And for people that are done with their formal education, who are still hungry to learn, this is an outlet for them. I think it's similar with cars, uh, and art as well. So a lot of people I meet are sort of very intelligent people who are looking to learn and hungry for knowledge, but also enjoy the watches themselves, enjoy wearing them, looking at them, the aesthetic element of it. So um, those would be sort of just quick general thoughts. On okay. This. And, and, and what about, um, I, I know there's a site out there called, I believe, Crowd and Caliber. Yes. So I, a couple of years ago, I went to an event that they did and they kind of, they're specializing in, in second, secondhand watches. So, yep. you know, you want to buy secondhand. And uh, if you go to a place like that, are you, is that, is that more advisable for maybe the beginner? Because maybe you won't get the steepest discount, but you know that it, the, I guess the provenance is, is, it, is, yeah. is there. It depends which way you're approaching. So within the pre-owned market, which I'd say is primarily watches from the last 20 years, that's a whole field that's being disrupted right now. There's lots of different actors trying to get large in that field. There's Bob's Watches, which is a great place for a Rolex. Crown & Caliber does sort of an array of brands. Chrono 24 is a marketplace for dealers and privates um, that I had raised over 20 million in investment and is getting very large 200 plus employees. Uh, there's a company called Watchbox, which has over a hundred million in inventory. Um, this company called Watchfinder, which was primarily UK based, was bought by Richemont as a sort of way for them to sell pre-owned or perhaps gray market. There's another company in Europe called Cronex, which has raised 20 plus million. Wow. Um, then you have sort of actors in the U.S. like the Real Real, which does watches as part of their pre-owned fashion. So there's there's all this disruption. The vintage world is different than those because almost all of those places are 99% modern. Um, vintage is really before 1980, before computers were used in watch design. Things were handmade. Um, actually, much uh, harder to fake because. I can, you can tell in a second if things are redone. For me, modern fake Rolexes are so good now, seeing the expensive ones that are sort of $600, that it's scary. It's very difficult for even super experts to tell. So that's part of the appeal for me is that these are really watches made both unique by time and that we're in much smaller production. Um, you know, it's not, it's pretty common for some of these watches that are very collectible for less than a hundred or less than 50 to be known to the community period. Um, so they're, they're pretty, 
pretty unusual and rare. Um, if you're looking for vintage, then I would say you want to go to like a smaller dealer like myself or some other dealers that specialize in that. But if you want like a 1995 Rolex, you could go to Bob's Watches or Crown and Caliber others like that. Gotcha. Or Crown 24. And how, um, I mean, it's very subjective, I imagine, at some point because you have a reference price originally and you have sale history and things like that. But what is a watch? You, every watch is a little different. Everyone has its own little history. Yeah. There's obviously, there's value if somebody famous owned it. Yes. You know, if you buy, a, you know, the watch from, you know, ho- maybe one day when we sell our watches, they'll have extra value. Yes. Probably yeah. not. Yeah. But um, we, if somebody's thinking about buying a watch, how negotiable is it both sort of in the in the vintage or in the or in this in the secondary market and also when they go to walk into the cartier store um so there's been it's sort of a positive halo effect because modern watches are have had a resurgence of their own particularly like sport steel rolexes Mm -hmm. there's you know 10 plus year waiting lists for the new gmt daytona etc uh, as someone said, it's a 50-year waiting list for the Daytona. Um, so that that's also bringing more attention to watches and the fact that you, if you're lucky enough to buy one of these watches, you can sell it for double when you walk out onto the street is, uh, is amazing and sort of brings more attention to it. Um, with, um, with vintage watches, it is very subjective. There is huge um, lack of data, so... What you can look at are sort of prices that were asked on forums, auction prices, depending on the model, as as baselines, and search around to see what other dealers have listed them for. Um, and then it's just a question of what you're willing to pay. And every watch is a little bit different, so it's uh, it becomes a matter of... Uh, it becomes a personal choice. It becomes emotional, right? I mean, how, how, when you think about collectors and the people you deal with, I imagine there's a range of people from the, the person who maybe is extru- extraordinarily experienced yeah. and has really built up a collection to somebody who's just getting going or wants to buy a present for their loved one or their son or daughter or whatever. Yeah. How, um, how do the, uh, how do people keep the emotion out and actually, you know, make rational decisions and not overpay for things. That's very difficult, but I think um, you just have to look at the data of auction and other results to get an idea of what you should actually pay. And you have to trust where you're buying it from, that they're not charging you 5x what it should really be worth, which it, which can happen. There's a huge amount of lack of data and transparency in the market. Right, and you mentioned, uh, I, I've heard you talk about the fact that birth year watches so i didn't even know this was a yeah. thing yeah because I, I, i'm from maine so we we don't know <laughs> we can't afford these things but uh but apparently people are very keen to buy a watch that's made in their birth year which number one it's really hard to prove because watches you know they're assembled over a period of time and number two you may or if you're really key, sort of set on having that watch from you know 1963 you may be willing to pay a lot more for some than somebody else over the value that it is just because you have the sentimental attachment, right? Yes. Yep. I think that's a very negative thing that's happening. And all the dealers I talk to that are being asked for a watch from 83 or 75 or 62, um, that is sort of the opposite of the collecting approach, which is to buy the best possible example, something that speaks to you. It's a very arbitrary thing. And that, becoming the primary thing you're looking for and you're avoiding everything else means you're not buying the best watch on the market for sure. It's for me, it's, it would be a nice to have if you happen to like the model and the watch, it's kind of cool. But unfortunately that's become the first thing people look for in many cases. That's where you should buy the fake and just tell people it's from (laughs) your birth. Yeah, exactly. Nobody's going to know apparently (laughs) (laughs) as long as you're not, you know, depending on your age, right? Yes. Depending on age for sure. (laughs) Um, Eric, I always like to ask guests the same question. Uh, This is the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on the rest. So what's your advice to our listeners? Of course, the most basic advice is follow your dreams, but do as much planning as you can. Make sure that you look before you leap. Put as many pieces in place as you can, and then make the leap. Maybe consider doing it as a 10% entrepreneur. Definitely 10% entrepreneur (laughs) first. Where can people find out more about you, find you on Instagram, all these other places? 
I'm at Eric M. Wind on Instagram, and my website is windvintage.com. Thanks for dropping by, Eric, and best of luck. Thank you. FOMO. And now it's time for the FOMO moment of the week. This is the time on the show where I talk about FOMO in pop culture or maybe talk about something that's giving me FOMO or that should be giving you FOMO. And this week, I want to talk about a new app I've been playing with. It's called Listen. It's a podcasting app, and it is pretty great because if you like podcasts as much as I do, and hopefully you do since you're here listening, you could probably have found that the standard podcasting apps have some things that they're missing, and they really haven't evolved as they should have done. And a friend of mine named Paul, who's a 10% entrepreneur and actually developed an app in his free time outside of his day job, has launched this company, Listen. And this is not an ad. I'm just using it and liking it. Why do I like it? Basically because it's very easy to use. It's beautiful to look at. The interface is really clean. It's easy to use with one hand. You can customize everything you need to customize. And it's just kind of a modern approach on podcasting. So it's done by somebody who actually has a podcast himself and loves podcasts as much as I do. And while you're there downloading it at Listen to a Podcast in the Apple Store, you can also consider tweeting or emailing me ideas for this segment of the show. So tweet me at PJ McGinnis, email me at let's connect at patrickmcginnis.com. And while you're online, you can also take the official FOMO Sapiens quiz to find out if you are a FOMO Sapiens. You can find that at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO dash quiz. FOMO. Big news, we now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO. FOMO.